Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is the first of five sessions about fidelity. What I mean by that is developing greater faith in our human body with all its biology, all of its mystery, all of its vulnerabilities, and all of its resilience. We'll be approaching it by using basic biological understanding of the structures and functions that are active inside our human body, and we'll be able to sensitively experience those during mindfulness meditation in order to, again, develop that quality of faith in the body. In addition, as we do so, we'll realize that the body returns that quality of faith, that it remains faithful to our well-being, supporting us in our lives, and doing its best to develop and maintain a feeling of well-being, zest, and purpose. As a structure to help us connect with the body in this affectionate and tender way, we'll use a system based on an acronym, I CAN. So the I CAN could stand for a number of things, like I CAN love my body, or I CAN free myself from suffering. I CAN feel loved and supported by life. Or I CAN awaken from the dream of separateness. You're welcome to come up with your own phrasing for this, but this is a positive message of our capacity as intelligent, aware organisms to use that intelligence in service of connecting with our bodies in a more harmonious way. The ICANN acronym stands for Interest, Compassion, Appreciation, and Nurture. Today I'll introduce each of these briefly, and then in the subsequent four sessions, we'll look at them in detail, one after the other. We'll be using the respiratory system as a focus for our exploration of the ICANN system. We'll move through it from top to bottom, exploring as we do each of the four elements, the four qualities, interest, compassion, appreciation, and nurture. So today is an introduction to each of these and also an introduction to the underlying problem that the ICANN system is meant to address. In our culture, we have this idea of a human body that we each carry around with us from the beginning of life until the end of our life. And we also have the idea of a human mind housed in the brain, according to modern neuroscience at least. And we also develop a sense of separation where these two are not harmoniously part of a single whole but instead the mind looks back upon the body from a kind of distance, looks down from it, as it were, from its perch up in the brain, up in the head. So there's this examining quality to the mind looking upon the body. That wouldn't be so much of a problem, except that we have a tendency to look at the body with a negative mindset, we tend to feel distrustful, critical and alienated toward our bodies. And there are many reasons for this. Partly it's just the fact that we age, have issues with pain and infirmity, illness, and that we're mortal. That makes us a little distrustful of the body right from the start, of course. But then that initial and rather natural concern is deepened and heightened by, for instance, the advertising industry that uses perfect looking young people to sell even poisonous products like cigarettes, the cosmetic industry that sends a continuing message that the body by itself is rather unattractive and it needs support from cosmetic products or even cosmetic surgeries in order to look good enough. Then there's the entertainment industry, which puts forward very attractive people often and gives us the sense that that's what we really need to look like if we want to succeed and be loved and so on. Now, of course, few of us have the looks of a movie star, and so that leaves most of us 
feeling rather uncomfortable with our bodies for all these reasons. And even the people that can pull off those appearances, when we hear about their private lives, there's often a sense of insecurity around the body. Added to all those factors is the medical system, which treats the body as a kind of device or machine that is fallible and needs tinkering and maybe even upgrading in order to function the way we would like. Here are some early medical instruments. We have much more advanced tools now, but the mindset has been consistent since the dawn of Western medicine, which is that the body is a mechanical thing, certainly not a sensitive living being in its own right, which is the perspective that I personally adhere to and am trying to share in these classes. So it would be nice if we could lessen this feeling of alienation between the so-called mind and the so-called body. Ultimately, we would like to feel more harmonious and whole with less of a sense of separation from our human bodies. But there's a process to getting there. And first of all, we need to break through some of this distrust. We need to, you know, break it down a bit. We can begin to do that by adopting a new model of the relationship between mind and body. Rather than the mind being a detached observer looking upon a mechanical body from a distance, we can see the two as both being rather sensitive and organic and in an intimate partnership, not very different from the kind of partnership that forms between two people who love one another. Over time, with this perspective, we will tend to grow closer to the body with less of a feeling of separation, perhaps in the same way that people that have been together in intimate partnerships over a long time come to function more and more as a harmonious whole and may even begin to resemble one another. So this model of mind and body in an intimate partnership gives us the opportunity to work on improving that relationship and making it more loving and supportive and mutual. The I can system then can be looked at as offering some ingredients for fostering a more harmonious mind body relationship. We'll be using the four limbs of the I can system to explore the human body. So here we have before us two idealized diagrams of a female and male body. And we each of us have some version of this. We may not look as young and well proportioned as these diagrams, particularly if we're getting older as I am, but the anatomy and the organ systems on the inside are the same. And we will be concerned more with how the body feels from the inside than how it looks from the outside. And as we feel into our bodily interior, we'll discover that there are energetic centers referred to in the yoga tradition as chakras. Within the yoga system, there are seven of these, and they can be directly experienced with introspective techniques like mindfulness meditation. And I don't think it's too difficult to get the experience of how these energetic centers differ from one another in how they feel. So the lower body, the lower pelvis, feels considerably different from, for instance, the region of the forehead above and between the eyes. Those energetic centers are both quite powerful, and yet they have a different felt quality to them. Now, within the yoga tradition, these so-called chakras, number seven, I'm going to take some liberties and reorganize them a bit to make it the system just a little simpler and to line it up with the ICANN acronym. So we'll move some of the chakras closer together and we'll look at them in four groups. Basically the head region, the chest region, the belly region, and the pelvic region. And we'll explore those in turn with interest, compassion, appreciation, and nurture. Our first stop will be the area of the head and particularly the area of the nose and nasal passageways. We'll use these as a starting point as we explore this quality of interest. We'll direct our attention using mindfulness to the area just inside the nostrils and the skin 
below the nostrils and above the lips. That will be today. Next time, we'll go further and look in addition to how air flows through the nasal passages all the way back to the throat and then heads down toward the lungs. So that's what happens on every inhalation, and of course the opposite happens on every exhalation. We'll get to that next time, but as stated, today we'll be focusing our attention on this region right around the nostrils. So I invite you to work with this quality of interest, feeling sensitively into the sensations of breath as felt at the nostrils, feeling how the air moves in and out, entering and leaving the nasal passageways right at the tip of the nose. This can be done by pausing this recording or returning to it later. We'll move on right now to the quality of compassion. Our focus for compassion will be the lungs. Now that we've been through the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have learned quite a bit about how vulnerable the respiratory system is to infectious agents and also by extension to pollutants, particulate matter, smoke, etc. And we're more familiar now with protective equipment that defends the sensitive lungs from these dangerous agents. The fact that the lungs are so vulnerable can be a call to offering them a feeling of compassion. So the body is vulnerable. That's one of the reasons actually that we distrust it a little, but rather than meeting that vulnerability with fear and distrust, we can meet it with tenderness and compassion. There's another way in which the lungs are a good focus for compassion. And that comes from the Chinese medical system, which recognizes the lungs diagrammed here by people who lived long ago and didn't have a modern understanding of anatomy. In that system, in the Chinese system, the lungs are viewed as the repositories of grief and sorrow. And I think we can feel this in our experience, the way heartache and heartbreak tend to be most palpable in the middle of the chest. We sometimes refer to this as our heart, but anatomically, it would be just as accurate to say that that's the region of the lungs, consistent with the Chinese medicine perspective. And so this is another reason why the lungs work well as a focus for compassion. And we can draw our attention in our own human bodies to this chest region and be tender toward it, both because of its vulnerability, the way the lungs can be damaged, and also because of its capacity to hold sorrow. In this exploration, we'll be centering on this middle region I mentioned earlier, the central three chakras. There's one final aspect to compassion when it comes to the body, and that's the way the body changes with age or develops illnesses or disabilities. So as mentioned earlier, few of us have a body that's as perfectly proportioned and youthful as shown in those idealized diagrams. And even those people that do look something like that will only look so temporarily. Eventually, they'll get old and their bodies will change and the appearance will be less consistent with the cultural ideal. And we can bring a feeling of compassion toward this aspect of human bodies as well. Rather than looking in the mirror and feeling disappointed or concerned, worried, or ashamed, we can feel compassion for all of the marks of age that the body has accumulated over our lifetime. Bringing a quality of love and tenderness, again, to this dear, sensitive being we call a human body. So this is another time that you could either pause the recording or use in your ongoing meditation practice, if you have one, and bring a quality of compassion to bear on your chest region, noticing the emotions that are held there, and perhaps even feeling the delicacy of the lung tissues, perhaps doing so with just a little imagination, knowing that the lungs are in there, a little vulnerable to what comes in from the outside, 
just as emotionally we are a little vulnerable to what comes in from the outside. But in this recording, we'll move forward now and discuss appreciation. To focus appreciation, we will look at the main muscles that contribute to breathing, at least the ones uh, below the chest. So the main muscle that we use for breath is the diaphragm, pictured here. And we can see how it has a kind of dome-like shape. And it functions by flattening that shape, which draws air into the lungs. There's also a contribution of the muscles down in the abdomen. These muscles participate in ways that we'll discuss in the fourth talk of this series. For today, it's easy enough to feel into the belly and notice how the belly wall moves with breath to get a sense of how this musculature that's inside there helps facilitate the breathing process, particularly during exhalation. Now, there are muscles in the chest and shoulders that also assist with breathing, but in this class, we'll be focusing on these lower muscles. It's quite possible to develop a greater connection with the breathing process and to use it to foster feelings of calm or even energy and well-being. There are lots of techniques from the yoga tradition, from Tibetan Buddhism, and elsewhere that are useful for optimizing breath and exploiting its capacity to alter our energy level. I won't be touching on these much in this class. The focus here is more in getting touch with the body, not uh, in altering its function. But you should be aware that these techniques exist. So for appreciation, we're focusing on the second chakra from the bottom that is, in the yoga tradition, actually rather connected with sexuality. And indeed, it's more or less in the location of the female uterus, which is also the location of the ovaries. And similarly, it's the beginning point for the male testes, which develop first up in this area and then descend into the scrotum. So there is a connection here with sexuality, but we'll be focusing more on how there is a quality of satisfaction and appreciation when we breathe deeply and calmly into our abdominal regions. That's one of those techniques that I mentioned. Slow, deep breaths that maximally move the abdominal musculature tend to be calming. So this would be a good place to again pause the recording or you can come back to a breathing practice later, one that focuses your attention on the movement of the lower belly and perhaps augments that movement a little bit. So if you slow and deepen your breath and bring it down into the belly a bit more, you will probably find that there's a relaxation that spreads through your body. In this recording now, though, we'll move forward to the final of the four I can roots and look at nurture. For this, in the last class of the series, we'll actually be exploring microscopic elements of the body, namely cells and some of the structures they contain within them. Of course, we can't feel individual cells, but we can feel the effect of collective cellular action. There are structures within cells called mitochondria that we'll review, and these effectively take the oxygen that the respiratory system brings in and use it to generate energy, much as a fire uses oxygen to generate heat. So we'll be looking at that in the last session. For today, we can just notice how there's a heated quality down near the pelvic base that relates to this cellular energy. Of course, cellular energy is distributed throughout the body, but there is a sense in which it's rather easy to feel down in the so-called root chakra of the yoga system, right down by the base of the spine. So now that the recording has reached its end, it makes sense again to either now or later in your meditation practice, you can feel into the lower pelvis, feel for warmth, 
there notice sensations of energy arising from that region. So that introduces our fidelity series. I hope that you find it helpful, that it makes it easier for you to connect with your body in a loving, affectionate way, that you have compassion for its vulnerabilities and its aging, etc., and that you learn ways to offer nurture from your body and also to feel how your body in return nurtures you. We'll be exploring all these themes in this series. Thank you for watching.